this is just the beginning. Welcome to the supply chain of social good virtual event from Axios. I'm Felix Salmon. I'm the chief financial correspondent here at Axios. I'm coming to you from my home in New York, New York. Many thanks to General Motors for making these conversations possible. And welcome to everyone. Uh, audiences on Facebook, on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course on Axios.com. There's an Axios events hashtag on Twitter as well as the at Axios account. It's all happening right now over the next 45 minutes. We're going to unpack how private sector leaders and the corporations they lead are contributing to social good during this pandemic. My first guest is the founder and executive chairman of Fanatics. Michael Rubin, and he joins us from just down the street here in New York. What does Fanatics do? You make sportswear, basically. Yeah, Fanatics is the largest retail licensed sports merchandise in the world. So if you're a sports fan, you're buying a jersey or a T-shirt. Hopefully it's coming from us. We operate the flagship Fanatics website, NFL shop, NBA store, NHL store, MLB store. And uh, we sell tens of millions of pieces of power and headwear a year. So the pandemic hits and suddenly all of those stores are closed down and your production facilities are in some kind of limbo. And you managed to decide that this is a great opportunity to make some lemonade out of these lemons. That's, that's the story. Well, you know, first, if you're in the business of selling sports, apparel, headwear, and hard goods on the internet, and people stop playing sports, it's generally not very good for business. So when all the sports started pausing in the middle of March, you know, we thought our business was going to take a really negative reaction because there weren't sports to drive the enthusiasm. And what actually happened was quite different, which is uh, people went to buy it online. They want a comfortable clothes. And actually our business, you know, from the really early days did great. But for me, um, you know, we thought about as a company, how could we give back and how could we make a big difference? And I started doing something that I never did before. I was watching CNN and I'm not a big TV watcher. And I started watching the news each night, like most people in the world to see what's going on. And I found out, you know, early on that, you know, there was such a shortage of, um, you know, face masks, different things that, that the medical uh, frontline workers needed. And that's when I realized in the middle of the night, wait a second, I own a factory that makes um, the official MLB jerseys in Pennsylvania. It just hit me in the middle of the night. Why don't we convert that factory into a mask making factory? So I called the commissioner of baseball, Rob Manfred, and said, hey, I've got a great idea. I think we should you know, shut down the production of Major League Baseball jerseys and instead make masks. And he said, great, what are, you, what are you gonna make them with? Do you have materials? I said, yeah, we've got the uniforms from the New York Yankees and the Philadelphia Phillies. Why don't we use these materials? He said, great, do it as quick as you can. So from the second I had the idea until we were making masks, was six days. And that's kind of the the mentality and the culture and really the way FedEx has been set up to be able to move very quickly. So you've got a bunch of masks. You got you spun up making masks. How long did that whole operation last for? Well we started making masks, I think, you know, obviously the sports paused in the middle of March. I'd say the idea popped in my head within a few days and we were making masks by um, late March. And we started make we made masks all the way through June until the the country really caught up with being able to get masks from more efficient producers. We made uh, over a million masks and different uh, medical gowns that were needed and distribute those you know at no cost for free to frontline workers at different hospitals throughout the country. And because you had relationships with a bunch of famous people, you managed to raise a bunch of cash as well for like people who were going hungry during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, what happened was pretty interesting. When we came up with the idea to make masks, and we did that, you know, in the middle of the, you know, the darkest days of the pandemic, when, you know, everyone's literally, you know, afraid to leave their house. And, you know, you know, all these medical workers who are putting their lives on the line, you know, didn't have the proper protection. You know, our employees were so excited about being able to help and make a difference. And so right when we made the masks and we got that into production, um, there was like just a huge rallying call amongst our 7,000 employees of Fanatics. And then I was I was home because normally in my life, I'm always traveling. I'm at different sports events. I'm with our different partners. And so being home without 
you know, really things to distract me. I started thinking about, well, what else could we do? And that's when it hit me. We've got so many great relationships with different, you know, athletes, artists, celebrities. And I kept seeing about how many people were struggling for food. And that's when, you know, we decided, why don't we create um, the All In Challenge? The All In Challenge was created to help um, hundreds of millions of people that, that needed food and providing, you know, enormous amounts of meals. And we actually created the biggest digital fundraiser ever where we raised uh, over $60 million dollars um, to feed people that didn't have food that were affected adversely from the pandemic. And we did it by getting, you know, so many great celebrities and artists and, and, and athletes who created once in a lifetime experiences that you could bid on um, either in an auction or soup stakes. And that raised more than $60 million. We did that in the months of April, and May, it was an incredible, um, you know, it was an incredible uh, experience for all of our employees and really everyone at Finax made this happen. We actually, from the idea until launching the website, was two weeks. And is that 60 million all all spent now? I mean, obviously the, the need hasn't gone away. Yeah, we donated all the money right away to four incredible charities, Feeding America, uh, No Kid Hungry, um, you know, four great charities that 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 that, that we worked with, uh, World Central Kitchen, and we donated that money as soon as we raised it. So all that money's been distributed immediately. I think had a really significant impact. And the great thing for me was to see how many people want to make a big difference. You know, Kevin Hart, who literally, you know, um, created a scene in one of his movies that you could win a chance to be in one of Kevin Hart's movies. To go on Drake's plane and go party with him in uh, in, in Los Angeles. Robert Translational Kraft, philanthropy. Give money. give money, donate money, and like get a get a thing in return. It's almost like you're you're selling these things. But tell me a little bit about like what what I might call compassion fatigue. So you have the beginning of the pandemic and you can start making PPE, which feels like this is a great way to give back to society. You can start raising these these digital fundraisers and give the money out and it feels great. And everyone's really amped to be able to help. Here we are in the second, third, I don't know how we're counting, wave of this thing. It's worse than ever um, by the statistics. And like how... How do you continue to try and keep that kind of giving back going? Like, what what's the ongoing way? What's happening right now? Well, the first thing is, I think everyone has different feelings. I have a strong belief that as a successful business leader in the private sector, you have a responsibility to make a difference. And one of the things that I've learned is every time that I think we're going to go out and do something that's going to make the world a better place, it's going to cost the company money. There's always a positive halo effect to doing it. So when you do the right thing, you get paid back by the culture in your company, by your shareholders, by your consumers. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I strongly encourage so many people to go out and figure out how they can make a difference. At Fanatics, we care about doing the right thing. We've always felt that way. We'll always take a stand when something matters. I think it's just, it really has to do with the culture of your company. Do you care about making more than just profits? And we do in our company. We have 7,000 people who wake up and go to bed, not only obsessed with growing the licensed sports industry, but also how can we make the world a better place? I'd say we're unrelenting in our pursuit to do lots of things to help. I mean, one of the things that, you know, you know, I'm hoping you're familiar with is you know, we've spent a lot of energy on criminal justice reform, which is something that I got into through a, you know, a, a situation of a friend of mine in 2017. And I think, you know, we're spending, there's not a week that goes by where, you know, me personally and our organization doesn't spend, you know, a real portion of the week trying to figure out how we can help with these issues. So I think um, you need to see, is this something you care about? And if you do, you should put real energy behind it. If you don't, then you should just not do it because you can't do these things if they're not really authentic. So I think just to, like, I feel that what we're seeing here is, a kind of voluntary response by corporations like your own. They see a need. They say, "Oh, we'll do we'll do a mask thing here. We'll do a hunger thing here. We'll do a racial justice thing here." Um, and those things are helpful in society. Should society, on some level, be able to rely on corporations stepping up when necessary, or is it something which, like, it's great if you do it, but it's not terrible if you don't? No, I think they need to. I, I, I think that government alone cannot do what needs to be done. It needs to be a true, you know, private sector pushing government, government pushing private sector, everyone kind of pushing each other up together. And so from my perspective, 
if companies don't do the right things during difficult times, then I don't think we'll get the outcomes that we need. And I can tell you that, you know, kind of working and spending most of my time in the pandemic, not worried about our business, but actually focus on, you know, making masks and then the all-in challenge, which was 100% of what I did in April and May. Um, I think that, that we had a chance to make a small difference. And that also leads other companies to make a small difference. And we get inspired by other people as well. So I think that companies need to do their part. And, I, you know, again, it needs to be authentic because if you don't care about it, then you shouldn't do it. But if it's authentic, um, you're going to help. And I think government alone can't do it. Um, thank you very much. Michael Rubin, thank you so much for joining Axios. It's been great having you on this event. And now we'll hand it over to my colleague, John Otto, who's got our view from the top segment. Hello, I'm John Otto, Vice President of Client Partnerships here at Axios. And joining us from Warren, Michigan is Gerald Johnson, the Executive Vice President of Global Manufacturing at General Motors. Hi, Gerald. Hey, John. So let's jump in. 2020 has proved its many challenges, but tell me more about GM's response to COVID this year. 2020 has come with a lot of surprises that none of us could have planned for, uh, not the least of which, of course, is COVID-19 and the pandemic. And I think I can stand proud of my organization, the team, our leadership, Mary Barr's engagement uh, that has allowed us to do some fantastic things this year. So uh, really excited about what we've gotten done in 2020 and what it means for 2021 as well. And so from what I understand, uh, you transitioned several manufacturing plants into producing ventilators and masks. Tell me more about that process. Sure. So um, probably the most exciting or most extreme example of, of what the team can pull together and do is the uh, engagement from a phone call with Mary Barra and Ventec, which is a ventilator manufacturer, uh, that was on a Wednesday evening that led to a Friday meeting in Seattle, Washington, that led to us installing process and capability in our facility in Kokomo, Indiana, in 30 days. And what took place in the first seven days uh, was amazing. We had to help source 760 parts with our automotive supply base. They had to commit capacity and capability to convert from automotive components to ventilator components for us. And they had to do that over the course of a weekend so that we could know where we're at uh, the following week. Our engineering team uh, got engaged with uh, digitizing both components and processing to come up with scenarios that were gonna fit inside of our Indiana operation. And then by Wednesday, we were clearing off a floor, uh, floor space in Kokomo, Indiana, and starting to receive equipment that led us to be able to produce our first ventilator 30 days later and ship that to a hospital in Chicago and then subsequent hospitals. And then ultimately the majority of our production ended up uh, uh, filling the, uh, the country's bank of ventilators to support the effort of the pandemic. Now, all the while, we were also loading up and processing masks for our first time in our Warren facility. Uh, we, we ordered purchased equipment that we learned from, quite frankly, our operations in, in Asia. Uh, that were already working their way through the pandemic, and we were able to translate their learnings quickly to uh, put, put about 75 million uh, uh, units of capacity of mask production in our warrant facility. We have volunteers from engineers and uh, operators everywhere coming in to produce masks uh, that we had never done before. And we, to date, we produce almost 8 million masks. Uh, excuse me, we've donated over 8 million masks. We produce over 18 million masks, and we continue to produce masks and more today, uh, supplying medical professionals. Uh, we supply over a million masks to high school students, um, similarly to elementary school students, first responders, police departments. And of course, we've also been supplying masks to our own operators so that we can execute safety protocols while we continue to build product. Hmm. Now, at the same time, this must not have been easy for employees. How would you characterize their response through all this? Our employees took it as a, a matter of pride to be able to contribute to uh, the pandemic, uh, the issue facing our country. Many of the people who uh, came to actually volunteer to uh, build ventilators for us were telling our, their personal stories at the same time of mom, 
or sister or brother or uncle or grandparent who in some cases were in the hospital as they were coming to work and in some cases sadly uh, were lost because of COVID-19. So they had a uh, purpose beyond production uh, and they realized that every every ventilator that we produce was a life saved and they took that very seriously and the same pride was in worn as we produced masks and we had again people volunteering to come in uh, learn the protocols necessary to do work and then start producing masks in high volume uh, again to support our communities so everybody i think responded with pride we also had a task force pulled together uh, with our uaw leadership and uh, this was a matter where as an industry, we decided we wouldn't compete, but that we would con collaborate. And so Ford, FCA, General Motors, uh, and the UAW were collaborating regularly as a task force team to put together the protocols that ultimately allowed us to return to work and share those protocols with our suppliers so that they could return to work and we could begin to bring the, con the economy back. Cool. And you did all this with a supply chain built for auto parts, not for ventilators or masks. We did, and uh, they rose to the occasion. Uh, the, the network, our purchasing organization, working with those uh, networks and the relationships were, were incredible. Um, and, you know, I, I like to say, and this is true for uh, every operator, every engineer, every skilled tradesperson, every leader, every, uh, every supply network, uh, crisis reveals character. And I think in the case of this crisis, in the face of this crisis, we showed our character to be one of caring, one of professionalism, one that uh, prioritized safety and the well-being of not only our immediate employees uh, and community, but even the country. So how does this year impact the way you might operate in the future? We learned a lot in this ventilator adventure. We learned that we could do a lot of things faster if we just uh, layer our teams and iterate through problems quicker and do more in parallel than in sequence. And also to enable more of our digital tools and technology that uh, short, shorten the, life, the cycle it takes to develop a vehicle. Uh, the result of that is uh, we've termed the phrase ventilator speed, and that really reflects on uh, how fast we can bring a team together, support that team to execute faster than they expected and faster than we have in the past. That's allowed us to take nine months out of our vehicle development process as we begin to roll out EVs as well. So it has a ripple effect. I'm really excited about 2021 as a result. That's great. Well, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, Gerald, thank you so much for the conversation today. And thank you to General Motors for their sponsorship. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. And our next guest is Carla Gallardo. Uh, you're in San Francisco. You are the CEO of Kiana. Um, tell us, what does Kiana do? What And yeah, how have you been coping over the past crazy few months? We've been doing well. Uh, Kuyana um, stems from the concept of fewer better things. We are a direct-to-consumer brand where we make essential product for women. So it's been, it's been quite a journey this year, uh, putting product that matters to market even more than ever. So you're, you're a fashion brand, right? There's not a huge amount of demand for high fashion in the middle of a pandemic. For high fashion, no. But for essential product, yes. And that's what we've, um, we've discovered throughout these very hard months for many of our customers. So tell me a little bit about um, what changed. Um, if, if, if the customers still need the essential product um, and you could still supply. But I guess the first question is like, what happened to your supply chains? Um, yeah. Were they massively disrupted? Yeah, look, it, it hasn't been easy. We had to take um, several actions throughout the course of this year, uh, not only to survive, but also to build a strong relationship with our customers. Um, you know, this means that we, we, we want to continue to stand behind our values of delivering fewer, better product to market and not resort to pushing product in a way that triggers unintentional and unwanted purchases because in the long term, that would hurt our brand. Um, and so at the onset of the pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty. And, and even though in a moment of, of um, fear, like the one that we went through, consumers really resort to buying what's really needed and what's really essential for their life. 
we knew that this global pandemic was going to impact the demand that we had originally projected in a way that we couldn't really foresee, right? We knew that the customers were going to gravitate towards a certain area of our assortment. We didn't know by how much exactly. There was just a lot of uncertainty that um, we couldn't plan for. And uh, we also knew that the rapid demand and growth that we were projecting for the business may not pan out. Um, so we had to take quick steps and quick actions at the onset. And particularly, you know, the first thing we attacked was our supply chain. Um, we um, operate a very lean supply chain that's been built um, by uh, building very strong relationships with family-owned factories around the world. And these families are um, specialized on premium materials. And so, you know, we're talking about the best factories of leather in Italy, the best factories of leather in Argentina, cotton, Pima cotton from Peru, right? So these are all very specialized factories and it's taken us really, you know, the entire history of the company to build the supply chain that we have today. So the first thing we, we did was to work with our suppliers to adjust our orders together. Um, you know, this wasn't a place where Adju we were... By adjust, you mean decrease, right? Just to be clear. Well, the, well a, qu quite a few things. Uh, part, part of the orders we wanted to decrease, those orders that, you know, we were very excited about and that was product that we thought maybe this may not be as... Uh, demand that this year as we, you know, in a non-pandemic year would be. Um, but also, um, you know, we, 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 we became, we, we became creative. Uh, we repurposed materials towards products that um, we knew were going to be more demanded. We moved some uh, new styles to later parts of the year or 2021. And so each PO we treated as a unique, uh, as a unique case. And we worked with our suppliers together to figure out win-win situations in which you know, both of us could make it through. And I think that was, this was very important for us because we were able to not only for Kuyana to, to, to end up right throughout the year and carry ourselves through the year with a, with a beneficial inventory position, but also we allowed our suppliers to make it through um, and not be forced to shut down uh, or or uh, have uh, major layoffs in their own factories. So just just translating into into English here, beneficial inventory position means you don't have a lot of stuff in inventory, right? You're you're running lean right now. Yeah, look, our you know our how we uh, how we operate our business is we produce most of the products we sell um, come from our best sellers catalog, which is offered year round. It's about 80% of our sales are those products. And so we're able to project very close to demand. Um, so most of the inventory we order is um, pretty riskless, right? Uh, we're, we're ordering pretty close to, to, to sale date. The rest, their other 20% are new products we, we place to, to, to the market. And those are the ones that needed the, the most attention. Um, and those are the orders that we work through with our suppliers as fast as we could and as, as much as we could to be able to reimagine them to fit the, the, the current environment. And your head office, I guess, is pretty small, right? When, when you're talking about your, like your stakeholders, your employees, people like that, it's mostly these people that you were talking to in the family owned companies rather than people who are like full time employees of Kiana directly, right? Well, ultimately, everybody is affected, right? The Kuyana surviving means that we will continue to be able to employ as much um, employees as we can, full-time, part-time temps. Um, and then, yes, we, I mean, we, through Kuyana, I would say tens of, you know, close to probably 100 families around the world are able to eat through our orders, right? Um, Peru, Argentina, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, Scotland, we 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 have very strong partnerships, and their livelihood depends on us too. And so, so working together was really key because it's not only about Kuyana surviving and Kuyana making it through; it's our supplier network who's responsible for creating the products we 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 make. And then, in terms of just the the effect of the pandemic on the ability of your suppliers to physically produce the material in the face of you know, a pandemic. Um, have you seen that change over the course of the pandemic where the shutdowns harsher at the beginning? Are you seeing them come back now that there's this big second wave? Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, everything shut down, right? So the, for the first few weeks, not only um, San Francisco uh, went into shelter in place, our factories did too. 
Um, some of our factories um, figured out ways of, of remaining open. You know, there were some rules in Italy, for example, where um, if you produce masks, you could keep part of your factory open. And so some of our uh, partners were able to continue to operate in that way. Um, but now we are back into full mode operations. And I, and I would say our, our factories figured out a way of reopening and, 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 and getting back to work. Um, within a few weeks of the onset of the pandemic. Um, look, every time there are new restrictions, right, and, and, and we're all getting through it, um, but we are, we've been able to meet demand in a way uh, that as of today is, 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 is pretty good. Um, when I mentioned that, you know, demand for, from, from our, for our product, we, we've been a, a business that is focused on bags, and that's most of our of our of our assortment of our sales are um, leather goods and work bags, right? And so uh, the demand for that product specifically this year isn't as strong as we predicted. However, demand for our small leather goods and our apparel has been incredibly strong. So we've been able to work with our suppliers to be able to fuel and actually right set help our our suppliers that produce that side of the assortment to to do it faster and in a leaner way. Um, and then we, we, we were innovating on the accessory side to figure out what is the right bag and what are the right bags that our customers need today, right, to, to, to get on with their, with their day that doesn't involve filling up your bag with all the things you need throughout the day as you go to work, right, and spend the entire day outside. Right. While we're designing for those micro moments, right, where we are going out of the home for a little bit at a time. And so what, what are the, the perfect bag, what's the perfect bag for those moments? Final question for you. What's what was the biggest trade-off that you found yourself having to make? Where where were the compromises? Where were where did you have to say, well, I really want to prioritize this and therefore deprioritize that? What what was the biggest who lost out on this during this pandemic? Short-term profit, Kuyana. I'll say that's the biggest trade-off. What we um look, our priority was to serve our customer with what we with what our mission is and it's fewer better. The first few weeks of the pandemic, we decided to pause on sales. We did not send marketing emails that uh, marketed products. We created content about slow living. Uh, we then put our suppliers as priority as well. Um, you know, and, and, and we, we were able to, to get to some agreements there with our product. Um, and then ultimately, with the products that we did put to market, I didn't get to that part, but the, but our, our our profits were reduced because we decided to uh, get to sell through, which uh, our goal is always to sell through 90% of all of our products. And in order to achieve that for those products that we couldn't uh, cancel or postpone orders, we actually uh, resorted to a very innovative pricing strategy where we positioned the product in a, in a lower price point from the very beginning rather than discounting later, um, such that our customers could intentionally purchase those products at a much better price point, probably more attractive, um, but still enforcing the, 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 our, our philosophy of intentional buying. And ultimately, the trade-off is Kuyana's profits, but we always see that as a short-term um, challenge. What we've built here is a stronger supplier network, and we've built a stronger brand that's, 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 that, 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 that has a long-term impact um, that is much more valuable. Excellent. Uh Carla Gallardo, thank you so much for joining Axios. It's been informative. Thank you. Our final guest is Edgewell Personal Care CEO Rod Little. Rod is joining us from South Carolina. Hi there, Rod. Hi, Felix. Uh, you oversee a absolutely astonishing range of brands. People might not know Edgewell, but they know what you make. What what do you make? Yeah, Felix, we um, we make a lot of things people use every day at home. We're a global personal care company that we make products like wet ones that are in very high demand given COVID nineteen. Um, Schick razors, Banana Boat, Hawaiian Tropic sunscreen products, and we also make feminine care products like Playtex, Stay Free, and Carefree. So global business, six thousand people two-thirds of which are frontline manufacturing and operations with the, the rest office-based. And the, the manufacturing operations, where are those like in the world? Yeah, spread around the world. Most of our manufacturing operations are actually right here in the United States. 
Um, we also have some European operations in Asia as well. And what happened to them in, in March? Walk me through this like presumably incredibly efficient global supply chain that you had. Like, did it all just, what happened? Yeah, it, it, was, it was fascinating, Felix, because at, at the beginning, um, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen in terms of Asia first. Right, we have a, a manufacturing facility in China that primarily serves our, our Asian region. We make some blades and razors there uniquely for Asia. Um, and they were first to, to learn, frankly, and understand coming back from Chinese New Year, um, what needed to be in place around safety protocols, managing the logistics and supply chain operations to make sure we had enough um, raw materials to even make our products and get them out. And the team there did a great job, frankly, of, of being the first ones through. We then took those lessons learned, which were in January. And as we got into February and into March, and we applied them to our manufacturing operations in Germany and then here in the States. And so we actually had a bit of a head start with the learning that we had in Asia as we brought it back to the States here. But the biggest thing that we were focused on first was just health and safety of our employee base. Second, continuity of operations. You know, we have a product, Wet Ones, that is in the regimen around hand hygiene and sanitization that's a key part of dealing with, with COVID-19 and flu and germs in general. And we needed to get every product we could out the door. And so we were really focused on first on health and safety and second on continuity of operations. So tell me about the trade-offs there, because it seems to me that's that's an obvious trade-off, right? On the one hand, the more emphasis you put on health and safety, the more that's going to necessarily sort of slow down the lines, maybe mean that you produce less stuff versus like you have unprecedented amounts of demand and you want to be able to get this stuff out there to help save the planet. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right on on the trade-off, and it, it, but it was an easy one for us to make. Um, we're a purpose-driven company with four values, and our leading value is people first. This idea that our people, it's the most important thing we have, and we've got to protect our people. Um, motivate our people in good times to give them great things to go do, You know, motivate them to, to go be great every day. At the same time, when, when it's not going well, have their back and, and have our people know that, that we have their back. In this case, what we did, I think it's, it's the most important decision we made early, is we instituted a new pandemic leave policy. It cost us extra money. It was a reallocation of resource. Think about us traveling less out to see customers to conferences and events. We redirected the savings from that spending into protecting our plant population. And so here's a, here's a concrete example of what we did. Pre-COVID-19, if our hourly people were sick or needed to miss work because that they were feeling unwell or they've been exposed to someone who was sick, they would lose pay because if you're not on the floor working, you're not getting paid. We changed that from the very beginning. And we said, hold on a second. If you're sick and feeling unwell, do not come in. If you've been exposed to someone who's had coronavirus, don't come in. If you need child care support or your kids are now working or studying from home as opposed to in school, or you need daycare support, go sort that out. And what we did is we gave everybody the right and option to have two weeks fully paid leave to go sort all those things out, effectively an incentive not to come in to get paid. We still paid you if you, if you stayed home. And what we ended up having was 40% of our population, plant population, in the early days of this, meet one of those criteria, either feeling unwell, needing a quarantine because they thought they'd been exposed, or needing to sort out childcare. And so we paid them for two weeks to go do that. It cost us more to backfill with other people, potentially take lines down during that time. And then we even went beyond that and said, if you still can't be sorted within those two weeks, we'll pay you at 70% for up to another 12 weeks. So we effectively gave people 14 weeks of coverage during the spring to get through the peak and get themselves sorted out in a way where we had their back financially when they most needed it. And so again, we're, and, and we're how's proud that of working that. out now? Like that was that was like peak one. Now we're in in peak two. Is is the same thing repeating itself? 
Yeah, not not nearly to the same extent. We still have people out. In fact, I was talking to our head of operations this morning. We have 60 people today in that pandemic leave pay policy. So as a percentage wise, single digits, you know, much lower percentage of our population that needs that today, partly because We've learned how to to live with this. Our our plant workers have been deemed essential workers um, from the beginning. We have worked very hard with with the idea that our plants are the second safest place for everybody throughout their day, other than only their own home. And we've tried to maintain that standard. So we've built loyalty and trust with our people. We serve our, our people, our essential plant workers have fed back. They're very confident in leadership via survey. Um, over 90% that we've made the right decisions to keep them safe. So the fact that we operated well, kept the virus out of our facilities in the initial wave has served us well this time. And people are being honest and and not taking advantage of the rules we, we put out there. Well, we'll pay them if they don't come in, right? They want to come in and be part of the team to get the products out. And tell me a little bit about like the products themselves, because these have become a very central part of crisis response on a personal level, um, on an institutional level, people are buying your products and using them. Um, how are you distributing them? How are, make, how are you making those kind of trade-offs about do we get these products to the people who need the most versus to the people who will, will pay us the most? Yeah, Wet Ones is, is probably the best example. It's our product in most demand um, where we can't make enough uh, a Wet Ones um, product. And so we did some donations um, early on into places like the American Red Cross, homeless shelters, to get them to people who were most in need. We gave them to some retirement homes as well to, to keep not only um, the, the people in the facility safe, but also the, the people that, that were going to work in those facilities. So that was one angle of it. Um, we have a very uh, generous donation program. The second piece of it now is how do you get it to consumers We've uh, had to double our capacity within the manufacturing plants. We've brought in new third-party um, logistics suppliers to, to help us uh, be quick in getting product out. And, and the biggest thing is we've, we've made partnerships with some of the biggest retailers to allocate them um, the maximum capacity we can because we know that they can get to the broader population with their existing footprint. So people like Walmart, for example, who serve the bulk of the U.S. population? We've tried to give them relative priority, knowing that that would give us the greatest reach Pri- to the end. Priority, consumer. priority over whom? Like who gets like pushed lower down the priority stack? Potentially some. Yeah, it's so. This is uh, it's tricky, right, to, to 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 say this publicly, but potentially some regional grocers, for example where um, you know, there's a Walmart right next door in their backyard. We love our regional grocers and we have a great relationship historically, but if you look at maximizing reach into to places where you know, consumers need things, you end up going to a Walmart footprint, for example, or a Target footprint or, or leveraging Amazon, right? And the Amazon platform to get it out to individuals um, you know, in a more maximal way. So that's the approach we've taken. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Try and get the the biggest reach as as simply as possible through the biggest retailers. Although I guess that just that's also good for the big retailers. Um, Rod Little, thank you so much for joining Axios. This has been very insightful. Thank you, Felix. Anytime. And thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to General Motors for making this event possible. Sign up, please, for my newsletter. It's called Axios Capital. You can do that at signup.axios.com, where you can sign up for many, many other newsletters as well. Thank you for joining this, and we will see you on axios.com.